at the odd and even transits to see if they're about the same depth or if they're a different depth. Again, if they're uh, significantly different depths, then that's an indication it's probably an EV and not an exoplanet. But this is a good candidate, and we re release it to the TOI list uh, and to the public. Um, this is a, uh, the second part of my job is um, to uh, participate on the test follow-up uh, observing program team. I, uh, I lead, if you will notice, can you see them? Yeah, so there are five uh, subgroups to this team. The top subgroup is in sort of purple blue there is uh, the time series follow-up photometry group. I lead that group. My counterpart, Sam Quinn, reads, uh, leads the reconnaissance spectroscopy group. And um, there's an adaptive optics group led by David Ciardi, uh, where they try to image really close around the star of interest to see if there are any contaminating objects. And then uh, my boss, David Latham, leads the precision RV group. There are only, uh, very few facilities in the world that can do the work that, to measure the mass of an Earth-like planet. And then finally, there's some work being done in space uh, from the space-based space photometry group led by Deanna Dragomir um, that used Spitzer uh, a lot. Is Spitzer officially stopped now or still going, Jerry? Uh, it had the last call for proposals. I actually yeah. hadn't heard it turned off. Turned off or no, still got it. Still got it. Yeah. Soon. Still got a year left. Uh, a whole year? Yep. We're still getting 600 hours. Okay. All right. Um, but uh, people are using HST to do follow-up, and then we have some other spacecraft observatories coming online that we'll talk about later. Out of our process. Uh, I, I want to say too that the facilities that Dr. Kilkoff has provided here have been one of the top contributors to my subgroup, the uh, time series follow-up subgroup. We have over 200 members of astronomers around the world in this group that include um, students like yourselves. It includes some um, advanced citizen astronomers, um, sometimes called amateurs, but I don't call these folks amateurs because they're really good at what they do, and, uh, and professional astronomers as well. It's a huge collaboration, uh, a lot of learning to be done uh, to, to, to get there. So I encourage you, if you're interested in such a thing, to, should I ask them to talk to you, John? <laughs> Um, but it, the, the test mission is very thankful for U of L's contribution to so much follow-up. And also, John is part of subgroup two, the Re reconnaissance spectroscopy subgroup, and a little bit maybe in uh, the PRV group as well with Minerva in the uh, down in Australia. So U of L is a uh, a member of that group too. Uh, out of all these follow-up observations, we will categorize a planet candidate as either a false positive, and we'll put it to the side. Uh, it can be a validated planet, which means we still don't have a mass, but we have enough other information where we can show statistically that it is almost certainly a planet. And then if we have a mass measurement, we refer to those as confirmed planets. And this is just sort of a flow of how things work. Uh, my subgroup SG1 and Sam's subgroup kind of work in parallel and sometimes also with the high res subgroup. And then once the candidate looks good in all three of those subgroups, uh, the more expensive or more time limited um, uh, availability of the um, mass measuring machines uh, come into play. Okay, so what are these false positives I keep talking about? Um, at the top left is one configuration. That the depiction there is three stars, and to test, the, so ignore the two stars on the right, sorry, should 
be a separate graphic. But uh, to test, all three of those stars appear in the same pixel. So test doesn't know which one of those stars might be causing a dip in the light curve. Um, the, the problem is the eclipsing binaries, they can produce, they would generally produce a very deep transit um, that would be too deep to be um, uh, consistent with a planetary system. So uh, what happens is when it's combined with the third star, the depth gets watered down in a sense. So you would see, Tess would see the shallow depth on the left, and then if we go observe it with a high spatial resolution telescope like we have here at Moore Observatory and out at Mount Lemmon, uh, we can resolve those uh, two different star systems and we can determine which one is producing uh, the transit. So that's a big part of the work that my group does. Uh, the second false positive is depicted on the right. It's just two stars but one star is just, instead of passing across the top, uh, the face of the star, it just skims along the bottom of the star. So it blocks less flux, and therefore the transit is shallower than it would be uh, if it were directly across the star. Then that can also appear shallow enough to look like a planet. Uh, we need uh, typically uh, spectroscopy to rule those out, or we can observe uh, in SG-1 uh, the transit in two different filter bands, and typically for two different stars, we will see two different depths of the transit because of the different colors of the stars. It doesn't work 100% of the time because if the stars have the same effective temperature, then uh, we won't see a difference in SG-1. Then down on the bottom left, you see what we're looking for, an actual uh, planet transiting the star. And the problem is, if you look on the right, a brown dwarf or a low mass star can have the same radius as uh, a giant planet. And so the only way to sort that out is uh, with spectroscopy, because the light curves look the same. So we need all these groups working together, and we coordinate our results through some systems, some web page tools that we have set up that this team of, the whole TFOP team is about 300 or 350 members so that we can all stay in sync around the world. So to date, what have we produced from TESS? Uh, a little over 1,300 TOIs or planet candidates. Uh, that's out of the first 16 sectors. Out of those 1,300, 14, uh, 414 are the small planets that are the TESS's primary goal. We want to measure the masses of small planets uh, with radius less than four times the radius of Earth. Um, so we have 14, uh, 414 of those to work with now. We'll probably have close to 1,000 by the end of the mission and we need to measure masses of 50 of those. So I think we're doing, gonna be doing just fine. Uh, we have tossed out 262 planet candidates as false positives so far, and we have 33 confirmed planets so far. That don't sound like a lot relative to the 1300 number, but the radial velocity uh, work can take a long time, especially for multi-planet systems. You need a lot of data points to disentangle, say for instance, like three sine waves together. We need enough data points to disentangle those. Let's talk about some of the science highlights. Um, so the first test planet that was published is called Pi Mensa C. Uh, this is actually a planet around a naked eye star. You can go out at, at, at night and see it if you're in the southern hemisphere. Um, has a V magnitude, if you're an astronomer, of uh, 5.65, and it's about 60 light years away. The key here is that this system had a previously known RV only planet. In other words, it didn't transit, but had been detected with radial velocities. So we had all of these radial velocities that mapped out the, the B planet that was already known. So once we knew the period of the C planet, we could then constrain that with the residuals 
from the V planet plot, and we can start to see the uh, radial velocity signal of the C planet. So this got published really fast because the RVs already existed and were actually public in an archive. Turns out this is in a period of 6.3 days, two times the radius of Earth, 4.8 times the mass of Earth, and it's quite hot at 650 degrees Fahrenheit. The first Earth-sized planet is HD 21749C. Sorry about all the, the crazy phone book number names, but uh, these are bright stars that uh, have had names for a long time, so we decided so far not to rename them. Um, so this is a, a nearly eight period day planet. Uh, it's just slightly smaller than Earth at 0 0.9 times the radius of Earth. For this case, though, we don't have a precise measurement of mass. What we have is a three sigma upper limit of five times the mass of the Earth. So we know it's, uh, it's limited to be uh, uh, planetary in mass. We just don't know the precision on that yet. Uh, it's 54 light years away and is also a sub-Neptune. The smallest one is a little bit smaller. Uh, is 0.8 our Earth. This is in a multi-planet system. This this particular discovery used uh, the SG1 uh, data from our group. Uh, significantly, we had mm, something on the order of 10 to 20 light.